I, I am a clinician. I'm a neurologist. Um, I was looking at my, in my, the topic of my talk. There, there are some words or phrases that are just, the sound of them are inherently unpleasant. Uh, your flight is delayed, uh, for example. Um, the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, uh, neurodegenerative disease. I mean, we're moving up the scale here. It's uh, just an inherently unpleasant uh, term. Uh, what I spend my time doing is, is uh, providing patient care just down the street here, just down the walkway at the uh, Gottschalk Plaza and across the sidewalk, I see patients for clinical trials. So I'm engaged a lot in uh, patient care, have been for years, this is what I do, and engaged a lot in working on developing new therapies uh, for a variety of things, uh, Parkinson's disease very prominently and also Huntington's disease very prominently. It's uh, gratifying work. I uh, like what I do. It uh, was the right choice for me. I never regretted uh, my, my career path, uh, but it does um, have its frustrations, and, and all of you who are dealing, those of you who are my patients, I know a lot of familiar faces in the audience today, know those frustrations firsthand of, of having uh, therapies that are not adequate in the case of Parkinson's disease, or having very little in the form of therapy, for example, uh, Huntington's disease. Um, Clinical trials have been uh, another gratifying part of my, of my career, and I'm always delighted when people are volunteering because this is how we make progress. We don't move forward at all unless people, like many of you who are here in the audience, are volunteers for uh, studying new potential therapies or learning more about these uh, disease processes. Uh, we have a poster over there uh, talking about some of our work that uh, Ed, who's a part of our group, uh, put together uh, the clinical trials are also a large uh, undertaking. They're complicated, they're uh, expensive, they uh, involve a lot of effort from the subjects, my patients and, and their spouses, their caregivers, etc., to volunteer and expose themselves sometimes to therapies that are not known to work or they may be getting placebo. We never know who gets what. About three or four years ago, we had a, a huge clinical trial in Parkinson's disease, and the, the intent of this medication was to try to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease, and it looked great. It was a home run in rats and mice. It was, it was a, a wonderful medication, and we, uh, with enthusiasm here, in many sites around North America, enrolled a large number of people in this clinical trial, it was funded, actually, by two pharmaceutical companies, uh, Cephalon and Lundbeck, probably to the tune of about $50 million or more to study this very promising medication. And guess what? Have you heard about this medication? No, because it failed. It did not work. Uh, after a lot of effort and tons of money, uh, it did not work. Um, I'm going to tell you something that, I, that maybe I shouldn't divulge quite yet because it's not public information, but we've been doing a big trial in CoQ10 for Parkinson's disease. Anybody aware of that? I learned yesterday it failed. Uh, and this is another huge trial, 600 people across North America, multiple sites. We were one, lots of effort, lots of expense. This was funded by the National Institutes of Health, and I'm sure, again, it was tens of millions of dollars to try to find something that would intervene in the progression of Parkinson's disease, and it did not work. We really need some new ideas. I think for, for therapies that we currently have, although they're reasonably good for Parkinson's disease, they are not great for, for Parkinson's disease, and they're almost not existent for Huntington's disease. And many of the diseases I see, apart from those two diagnoses, therapies are really not uh, gratifying. We need some new ideas. We need some some new, uh, I think, doors to open up to shed new light on understanding this is, these disease processes and developing new therapies. This, this building, I regard as a building of doors, and we're waiting for those doors to be opened so that we can understand these diseases more uh, clearly and, and uh, uh, appropriately develop therapies that don't necessarily entail hundreds of people enrolled from uh, uh, hundreds of sites across North America costing tens of millions of dollars that don't necessarily work. One way that we could possibly achieve that would be by modeling these diseases in the laboratory using 
human stem cells derived from uh, skin cells. Uh, some of you in the audience have got little scars on your forearm because you came to see me and I took a skin biopsy from your arm which was taken to this building where stem cells are being created from those uh, skin cells in order to study Huntington's disease. We're going to hear later today from the Parkinson's Institute, from Dr. Shula, about how that can be accomplished in Parkinson's disease. This is an, an opportunity, as, as Lisa Gibbons has said, as Peter has said, of, of new uh, motion forward in understanding disease and developing new therapies. And I am personally excited for my patients and their families as we move forward in this effort. That concludes my brief talks, my, my brief uh, comments, and I, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce the next speakers who I, I've never met, but I, I, I'm already impressed by them. Uh, this is Serge Morales and Susan Franklin. Uh, Serge was honored in 2007 as the Caregiver of the Year for the by the Alzheimer's Association for caring for his wife, Susan Morales Franklin. Susan was diagnosed with young onset Alzheimer's disease at the age of 55. They've both been a force in raising awareness and money and research efforts for Alzheimer's disease. One in eight baby boomers will get Alzheimer's. I am a baby boomer. My name is Susan Franklin and I have Alzheimer's. When Lisa Gibbons asked me to be part of this pr program today, I immediately said yes, without hesitation. I don't like to speak publicly, but I must. People need to know what this, this do, disease is and what it can do to people. I live, in I live in Los Angeles with my husband, Serge, who is my primary caregiver and is here with me tonight, today. I was, at the top, I was at the top of my career when I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I was a regional network director for HealthNet in Wilden Hills, and it was an executive position where I negotiated physician contracts with, with <coughs> contracts with physician group and cop and I negotiated contracts with physician groups and hospitals. I am also a registered nurse and I hold a master's degree from UCLA. I was 55 years old when I started having difficulty speaking and I was forgetful and at the same time I didn't think anything was wrong with me. In hindsight, I was really in denial that anything was wrong with me. In mid-2005, two of my girlfriends, one of my boss, told me that she noticed that I was repeating things. I was going back to people a second time or more and telling them again what I had previously asked them. Another of my girlfriends took me to lunch and told me that I should see a doctor because something need something seemed to be wrong with my memory. During a mid-year review for one of my associates who reported to me, I asked her if there was something I could do for her that I was not doing. My associate said, I wish you would not forget things and not repeat yourself. When she said that, I was just devastated. So then, my wake-up call was, I, since, I then, um, since I then knew that something was wrong with my memory, I knew um, I needed a diagnosis. I contacted UCLA, my alma mater, and met with neurologist in, in um, August. August 2007. Over the next couple of months, I had a battery of tests, and on December 5th, 2007, I was diagnosed with mild early onset Alzheimer's. The biggest impact to me and my family is that I can no longer work, nor can I live fully without 
being concerned that I will forget things and not be able to remember things and unable to be and unable to find words to speak. It took me a long time to be able to share my diagnosis with my family and friends. Once I received the, di the diagnosis, I could have easily resigned myself to do nothing, or I could do something, and I chose to be an advocate. Being an advocate for Alzheimer's keeps my husband, Serge, and I very busy. I serve as an at-large dilemma I serve, serve as an at-large delegate to the State Public Policy Council on Alzheimer's, and I serve on the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Adv Advisory Committee. The committee provides oversight for the State Alzheimer's Plan. Both my husband and I work closely with the Alzheimer's Association, speaking to health care professionals, other people with this disease, and at fund, fundraising events. We go to Sacramento and Washington, D.C., speaking with our elected officials regarding this disease. Here are some alarming, sorry, here are some alarming number, numbers regarding this disease. Every 69 seconds, someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And one of eight baby boomers will get this disease. The Alzheimer's Association came out with the projected facts and figures for the state of California. In the next generation, the number of Californians over age 55 living with Alzheimer's will double. Alzheimer's is not limited to older adults. It can occur, it, it can occur in a, individuals in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Alzheimer's is now the sixth cause of death in California. We, na we need a cure. Now, now, now. I would like personally to thank Lisa Gibbons for what she's doing to raise awareness for this terrible disease and for, brought for, and for providing support services through Lisa's place. Thank you so much for listening to my story. My name is Serge Morales and I'm Susan's husband and partner. Once Susan and I knew there was something wrong with her memory, we received and we needed answers. After completing a wide range of tests at UCLA, Susan was diagnosed with mild early onset Alzheimer's in December 2007. This was a very devastating situation for both of us, and what do you do next? The biggest impact of this diagnosis was obviously accepting the fact that she has Alzheimer's. As, as a result of her word finding and memory issues, I am learning to continue to learn to be more patient and tolerant. Because she's unable, readily un because she's unable to readily recall and say things, I am constantly reminding myself that it's the disease that's affecting her. What Susan previously did without hesitation has slowed her down. Obviously, facing the future is and will continue to be the challenge. Susan and I have always been positive people in our outlook of life, and this will continue to be the case. Nobody asks for this disease, but we accept this fact. As a result, we have both become advocates for the disease. Together, we have become actively involved with the Alzheimer's Association. We spend a lot of time together in her support groups, attending meetings, and speaking engagements such as this one today. 
Both Susan and I are very optimistic about the future. We both believe there will be better drugs developed to slow the progression of the disease, if not a cure. In the meantime, we continue our lives by carrying out our normal activities and taking vacations, day trips, and socializing with our dear friends. We both want to thank Lisa Gibbons for what she is doing. Thank you.